Hi there, everyone. I'm Mark Stubman from Folkway Music here in Canada. I hope the start of your summers has been good, and uh, mine has. It started with completing this guitar just today. It's a 1943 Gibson Banner Southern Jumbo. Pretty fantastic guitar. Pretty exciting instrument. It's really, really, really clean, and uh, just uh, just rolled off my bench today, which is nice. It's been it's been keeping me company for a while. Um, anyways, you don't come across too many Banner Southern Jumbos, and certainly not those that have this black stripe running down the front of it. That's what we Gibson people like to call a skunk stripe. Don't ask me where that name comes from. Obviously, it's a stripe on the center of something, so skunk comes to mind, but I don't know who coined that phrase. Um, it's a bit of an odd phrase, but there it is. That's what we call them. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a 1943 model with a two-piece red spruce top and a, a book-matched mahogany back. Um, it has a three-piece neck, maple, um, with a hardwood center strip and uh, a no truss rod. You can see it has the, this one has the maple triangle uh, running the length of the neck for strength. And uh, it's uh, scallop braced. It has a massive neck and uh, the original tuners on it, original finish throughout. Um, let's see if it's in tune. Still mostly in tune. I do wish I had it strung left-handed for this video so I can actually play it for you. Anyways, really cool sounding guitar. These. Uh, these guitars are pretty big and forward sounding. Um, a little brash, the maple on the neck adds, uh, adds some clarity and some power and some brashness to the guitar. And the red spruce certainly helps the cause. Um, they're great sounding guitars and there's a lot of reasons why people look for these instruments, particularly in condition like this. Anyways, I thought that I would, um, I thought that I would chat a little bit today about, about that skunk stripe and, and, Gibsons that are painted black in general um, because it's an interesting thing. We, we wax poetic about these banner SJs and their stunk, skunk stripes um, but there's not very much discussion as to why they're there and what they're about and um, having this on my bench for the better part of the last month working away on it um, I look at this skunk stripe every day and I'm you know just thinking about why it's there and what Gibson was thinking and uh, there's a few hypotheses about why the skunk stripe was painted on. And um, I have my own, and I thought this would be a neat form to, to share them. So we see the skunk stripe on guitars from the Banner era. The Banner era meaning the only Gibson is good enough headstock banner right there. From 42 to roughly end of 45, somewhere in there. And uh, the Banner era uh, corresponded with World War II. It also corresponded with a time when Gibson's workforce was different, as many of the men that staffed Gibson uh, went off to war. Um, and so the factory needed to hire locally um, anybody that can, you know, handle a tool. And so what we now know is that uh, during the war years, Gibson's staff comprised of a lot of women who made guitars. Um, and I have my own theory that because the women were making these guitars, I'm sure a lot of these women were not guitar players. Um, they might also have had different sized hands than their men counterparts. And I think that might have something to do with why Gibson banner necks are so remarkably large. I don't know if someone who plays guitar would have noticed that this neck was so big. It's a comfy neck, it's very round and nice to put your hand around, but it's quite a bit larger than most people want a neck to be, at least these days. And uh, that neck size is part of what makes a banner a banner. It, it, uh, it's, it, it adds a lot of mass to the neck, and when you have that much mass and that much maple in a neck, you can rest assured that there's gonna be a lot of sonic effect by the size of that neck. This neck here measures one and three quarters the nut to two and an eighth of the 12th fret. Um, in depth, it's over an inch thick here. It's 1.04 inches. Um, so uh, an inch and a 32nd. 
um, at the first fret to 1.1 inches here at the ninth fret. So it's really big and you have to really like a big, big fat neck to, to really want to play this guitar. Um, I do and it works great, but certainly you're not, you know, you're not Steve Vai on this guitar shredding because the neck is a little too big for that. Anyways, the other thing was that these women and other sort of temporary employees that Gibson hired for the war were not seasoned guitar builders. They didn't have 20 years of guitar building under their, uh, under their hands. And so things changed, things were done differently. So you see very many different shapes and styles of bridges on Gibson during the Banner era. You, if you look inside, you'll see different, um, the braces look a bit different, the kerfing looks a bit different, but you also see these skunk stripes. So, um, in chatting with another, with a, another Gibson historian, um, he was suggesting to me that the skunk stripe was there to distract from uh, any cosmetic blemishes that the top might have. Um, because, of, because of the war, getting good materials was pretty hard to do. Um, red spruce was in shorter supply, and certainly guitar-sized red spruce was hard to come by. And so Gibson was using wood that might have been subpar. Um, soon after this guitar was built, we regularly see four-piece top uh, red spruce guitars um, before Gibson ultimately switched to Sitka uh, shortly thereafter. Um, but this is a two-piece red spruce top. The way I see it though, this, this top looks great. There's nothing really to hide about this top. It's a beautiful top. Uh, it's quarter sawn, it's tight, um, it's book matched nicely. There's no weird knots or grain whorls in it. It's actually a really nice top. Um, so there was nothing to hide there. What I did notice when I was working on this guitar is that this whole center seam was spliced. The center seam had a, it was not glued well. And so the Gibson had to splice that center seam. It had opened before the guitar was even finished and Gibson had to splice it, i.e. repair it. And then to hide that splice, they carefully painted black over it. Now, we see this, we see every, and I should say, every skunk stripe guitar that I've ever worked on, every single one of them that's been on my bench has had a center seam that has been substandard, either having a splice or just gappiness and filled with glue, just a, a low quality center seam. So this was basically a factory second top that Gibson didn't want to have to rebuild a whole guitar for, so they spliced the top and then they painted it black. Now, here's the interesting part to me. You see skunk, skunk stripes on Southern Jumbos. We see them sometimes on LG2s, and every now and then we'll find a J45 with a skunk stripe on. But most of the skunk stripe guitars that, that we've seen are on Southern Jumbos. Now, why? Why on a Southern Jumbo is it a more expensive guitar? Why would they put a factory second top on an SJ? It's a good question. So I was thinking, and this is entirely just a hypothesis, no science whatsoever going on here. So just a point of discussion. This model was introduced in 42. It's called the Southerner Jumbo. And it was designed, uh, it was called the Southerner Jumbo, not because they were gonna ship it to people in Michigan and in Pennsylvania, you know, they were designing this guitar to ship it south. And there's a lot of music happening south of Michigan. And so Gibson figured, hey, let's try to get in on some of that action and make a dent in Martin sales in the south. So they designed a guitar called the Southern Jum Jumbo that was supposed to appeal to people in the American South. Now, Michigan, in the wintertime, gets cold. When air gets cold and you heat it, you dry it out. When wood dries out, it shrinks. And any flaw that's in the wood is a problem spot where a crack might develop. Now, the people at Gibson knew, okay, well, we can't have our guitars cracking all the time and quickly. So maybe if we take these tops that are destined to crack because of the flaw running right down the center of them, and we ship them to a humid place like the American South, Maybe these tops will survive even with their flaws. And so that's what I think, that's why I think that the skunk stripe guitars ended up on SJs. Now, I have no idea if this is true or not, none whatsoever. This is my little harebrained hypothesis hanging out in my, in my shop here all by myself all through COVID. 
But that's my thought. I, I think that these things went on SJs because these guitars were heading to dealers and buyers and resellers in the South, where the chances of this guitar getting too dry and cracking were much lower. So let's put these, let's make these tops with these bad, let's make these guitars with funny tops into Southern Jumbos, ship them southward, paint it black, it's a cool accent, it looks really neat, maybe they'll dig it, and our problem is no longer a problem. Gibson was always doing interesting things like that to make their problems no longer be problems. The Gibson L00 that was black was black simply because they had lousy wood and they had to cover it. Uh, Gibson's low-end mandolins were painted dark. Why? Because they used sub substandard materials and they painted it black. Uh, oftentimes you'll see what's called a stringer uh, along the edges of a, of a neck on a 50s Gibson. Why? Because the neck joint wasn't very well done. So they filled it with wood fill and then they sprayed it black and off it went. You'll see that same thing happen on the back of headstocks. Sometimes you'll see stringers. They became a normal part of high-end guitar design. Um, J200s and L5s and, and such would have the back of their headstock painted black to a point. That's what's really called a stringer. But sometimes they did that on guitars that weren't high-end. Why? Because there was some flaw here and they tried to cover it up. Gibson was always painting things black to hide problem areas. And now, 50, 80 years later, we love it. It's totally endearing to us. We love these black guitars. We love these black accents. And we actually pay more for a guitar like this that is technically a factory second, even though Gibson would never fess up to it being a factory second. Now, this is a design feature that we just love and we search out, particularly if, if one has lasted in such fine condition that we know, yeah, it probably did go somewhere warm or stay uh, stay well humidified over its life. This guitar is clearly has stayed in wonderful condition its whole life. And so this this top seam was never a huge problem. It was a problem. It was open when it got here and I've completely flattened it and restored the top center seam and reinforced it so that it's no longer a problem. Um, but that was the guitar's only problem is that that open. Anyways, Banner, Banner Gibsons are full of mysteries and uh, they're super interesting. Unfortunately, there's not enough of them around, enough of these skunk stripe guitars around to, to say anything with absolute certainty. So I'm just gonna put that theory out there as, as just that, a theory, and you can, you can think whatever you want about that. Um, as, a, as a guitar repair person in Canada, we see a lot of humidity-related issues, and, uh, and just putting my thinking cap on, I kind of think that they put these things on Southern Jumbos simply uh, to ship them south and not have to worry about uh, this, this repair possibility that happens here. Anyways, in the case of this guitar, it was a good idea. So, Banner Southern Jumbo, there's so much more you can say about it. Why they had all these different bridges, you'll often see in the same batch as this, actually. I've seen pictures of a, new, a number of guitars from this batch. In the very same batch, I've seen three different bridge styles on these. This kind of bridge, um, the sort of post warish looking bridge, which I don't know if is original or not because you're looking at pictures, a bridge could have been changed. And, and the lacquered over belly bridge, which was original. Why they put a belly bridge on some and a rectangle bridge on others in the same batch? No idea, anybody's guess. Anyways, long and short. They're wonderful guitars, loud and brash and in your face and a lot of fun to play, as long as you like a big neck. Anyways, there you go, Banner SJ on the bench. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments below. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about my uh, my harebrained scheme of sending Southern Jumbos to the South so that the tops don't crack. All right, well, thanks. You take care. Bye-bye.